started looking at the book of Hebrews, and I thought it was interesting. The more I thought about the introduction and such and who the target audience is, looking at the, this writer, <clears throat> we kind of, at least I feel that uh, we don't really know who the writer was. We do have kind of a timeline because we know there's no mention of the destruction of Jerusalem, and when the writer gets to where he's going to talk about the sacrificial system in the temple, he speaks of it in a present sense, tense, that as if it's still occurring actively. So we, we kind of have that idea. But the target audience is important because he's writing to Hebrews. You know, so that, that kind of puts all of us out, unless you grew up under Mosaic Law, a little at a disadvantage, but not too much because we can still grasp the end of it. In other words, the main point of what he's trying to bring across. But looking at that, let's keep that in mind because from a Hebrew in that timeline, and when they're living, and they're listening to this letter being read to them, there's probably two types of Hebrews that may be reading this letter. There's those that believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that Jesus, the man from Nazareth that was crucified by the Romans, Jesus is the Christ, and they became a Christian. Then you have those that are Hebrew that don't, but they have a great understanding of the Mosaic Law and the ceremonial processes and all of this. So the language that he's going to use is what I call Hebrewic. It's very driven around the customs and such where a Hebrew listening to this should be able to follow along. The other thing I think is great about this book is that I've always wondered how did Paul approach those in the synagogues when he went in there? And I think this whole book is kind of a, an approach that Paul would reason. We know that he reasoned many Sabbaths in some of the cities he went to. So to me, I think this is kind of a, a complete um, narrative of the way that he would go in and start reasoning with the Hebrews. Because we know that if you're going to talk to the Hebrew and you're going to convince them that this man Jesus was the Christ, then you've got to start where? You've got to start with the prophets. And you've got to start there. And that's exactly what we find that this Hebrew writer does. And he has to establish the fact before he can go any further in the conversation, and he has to bring that together, this idea that this man, Jesus, is supported with the fact that the prophets point to him. And that all the prophecies, you can't escape, they kept pointing to that man, Jesus. And that not only that they pointed to him, but they declared him. They, they, they explained it. You could look and go, Wow, that man lived this life. We know what he did, and this is what the prophecy was. And that's it. Wow, that's exactly what you're talking about. I can see this. So he's got to start with establishing the credibility of the man Jesus as being the one that the prophets and the one that they should have been looking for. Now, it's not a matter of trying to get the Jew or anybody to choose between being a Mosaic law follower or a Hebrew, or a Jew versus Christianity, okay? And, and that, that's kind of my bad. I, I think when I grew up, I used to think that it was kind of trying to talk the Jews out of being Jews and making them Christians. That's not what he's doing here. That, that's something that, because I'm not a Hebrew, it's hard for me to grasp. But what he's talking about is a completion, a fulfillment, a blessing that God has continued He's not saying abandon. He's not condemning. God never condemned the old law. He never said it's all, right, it's all wicked and now it's done. No, no. He wants them to come to rejoice and celebrate the fact that this is everything that was promised to them as Hebrews. Going all the way back to Abraham. But we've got to come back to that man. We've got to come back to that man. And so... And that's what we're going to see that the Hebrew writer does as he comes through here. But the whole book, honestly, is about the glory and the superiority of this man, Jesus. And I say that that way because if you're reading this, some of you that are reading this at the initial time are still going to wonder, okay, I know who the man was, but now you need to build your case. And so that's why I think. So he's got to start with the greatness of the man. And so he goes through this. Now this is a little bit of an introduction before we come back and look specifically at some aspects of the first chapter. 
And so there's some things in the flow of this letter that you see that he does. And the first one is, the greater than the prophets. So why is that important? Well, you couldn't get to a Jew. You couldn't get much greater than a prophet. Greater than Isaiah? <laughs> you know? Greater than Ezekiel? Greater than, you know, Isaiah? I mean, uh, I mean, all those prophets, how could they be greater? Because they brought such a message that was so important and they valued them so much. But he says, no, he's greater. And we'll look at the details when we start getting more right into the chapter, why he says that and how he shows that. So he's greater than the prophets, greater than angels. And we're going to talk about that because there's a reason. It's kind of neat why he talks about angels. It's like, did he just throw that in the list? You know, I mean, okay, greater than prophets. I get it. Yeah, you got to show the Jew that, you know what? The prophets are really, really amazing, but this Jesus is better. But angels, why would you have to go there? There's a reason he did. Now he gets personal as he goes in this book, as he's going along. The next one is greater than Moses. And the fact he's going to show how Moses spoke about this prophet that was to come. They know this. They remember that. They read it. They grew up knowing and hearing about when Moses was passing the torch and when he received the law and everything, how that, that there was this one that, you listen to me now, but you wait. There's one that's going to rise up among you that you're going to listen to. That's the one you want to listen to. And he's going to show, I know the name, the man's Jesus. So he's got to show he's greater than even Moses. And then Joshua. Now you're starting to, you know, sometimes <laughs> you wonder, like I look at Stephen's speech, and you look at some of them where the Holy Spirit has spoke through these men and, and the audience, even like when Peter and John are standing before the council, and we know that the Holy Spirit is, is guiding them and giving them that message. And so I'm always just fascinated by how did it get crafted? You know, how did the Spirit craft that? And what was the purpose behind it? And if you go and look at that, when you start to go through those again, maybe it'll bug you and you'll start to notice it. But it's, it's amazing how well that the Spirit knows his audience and he's able to do that. And that's what he's doing here. Because he's going to build up and show all these connections to these prophets and to all of this that then he's going to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. It's almost like a broken record, a skip record, a skip record, and going back to Jesus, going to Jesus, going to Jesus, and just confirming it. Here it is, there's Jesus. Here it is, there's Jesus. And so he starts out right off talking about how great he was. He's greater than the high priest. Whew, now, this is going to be something he's going to have to really work. Because they knew in the prophets that this king was going to come and he was going to be king. So this Jesus has to be a king. But you can't be greater than a priest and still be king, can you? You know, so it, they're kind of cocking their head when they hear, you know, okay, you got to work me on that one because how do, you, how do you do this? And so he's got to. He's going to do that. And so then he'll connect because of the priesthood because there's no way in genealogy that you can trace it back and find where he could be both. He, can't, he doesn't come, there, it's not like, you know, a second cousin married into, you know, from the Levites and got over, ah, oh, there it is, there it is, we can connect it. Kind of like I do and we do sometimes for third and fourth cousins, you know, we'll say, oh, yeah, 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 we're related. You could do that. No, you can't. Not with Jesus. You can't connect it. You could only be a, Le, a, a priest if you were a Levite. And you could only be a high priest if you were a Levite that was from the family of Aaron. Very specific. So how are you going to do that one? Because he's got to show he's both king and priest in order to bring to the final end of it, which he is the promised one. And that's why the like, kind of I was talking this morning where they had all these picture pieces. And they had this idea of this image of him being a priest. They had this idea of him being a king. They had this idea of the kingdom. But now, like Paul said, now it's revealed. 
And now the Hebrew writer is going to do the same thing. He's got to bring this all together for them. So for you and I, we've grown up listening to this stuff. You know, we've grown up to the idea that, yeah, he's our priest, he's our king. But now put yourself as being a Hebrew, listening to that. This is offensive. You want to get me offended? Run down, Aaron. <laughs> talk, talk like something else could ever be more superior to the, all the things that he's going to address. So he has to do it logically. And we know that this writer is inspired. And then Melchizedek, out of nowhere. They're familiar. They know historically. Yes, absolutely. We, we know this person exists, Melchizedek. But he's going to link who he was and help bring this all together. But again, everything that he does as he goes through there and shows the completion of God's promise to them, he keeps going, and it's Jesus. And it's Jesus. What'd I say? Right, it's Jesus. He's the one. And that's why I think that Paul would have used very similar strategy of coming in and talking to the, the Jews as he traveled and established congregations and made contact with people. So he also says he's greater than Abraham. He says he's also, he brings a greater covenant. And all of these things are going to kind of, every time he says something about something being a little greater than, the Hebrew is going to go, no, there's really not. <laughs> you, you know, everything we have, because we know even Christians that were Hebrews and converted, they struggled, didn't they, with letting go. And not letting go, but accepting the new and the fulfillment. And that, every time we do that, we tend to divide cleanly and say, bam! Judaism, bam, Christianity. No, it was a flow, a beautiful connection. And I think we do that because sometimes authority. When people try to use authority from the old law to practice what they do today, and I know I grew up with that. I heard my grandpa talking about it, you know, taking a rubber band and putting it on that Old Testament. No, oh, you can't go there, but we'll talk. And when we did that, we ourselves have done a little bit of violence to the concept of how beautiful... Those two are together. And I hope that as we go through this, you're going to be excited when you start to see this magnificent plan. Because we have some more knowledge. We're not just the pagan in the first century that really hadn't the experience. We have all, through the years of growing up as Christians, have been receiving an understanding of Mosaic Law and the Levitical processes and organizations. So, so we know that and then he's going to really bring it in on, he brings a greater tabernacle. Now, tabernacle, temple. Now, remember, God brought a tabernacle. That's what he initially had them build, was a tabernacle. It wasn't until when David on his deathbed that he gave him the plan and he allowed a temple to be built. Now, what was a tabernacle? Well, it was a place in which they, where God resided in the Holy of Holies. And where they were able to come and they have a place in common that they could come and be with God. Yeah, but they couldn't quite get over that veil, right? They couldn't go over there. But he was right there. And so they had a place, a fixed spot, because that's our dimension. We can't grasp that other dimension he's in, but we could see it. And God was saying, I'm right here. And so they had a place, God said, but you can't come to me without the problem that you live in. And that's your sin. And so through the tabernacle, it helped fix that problem. And they had the ability to come to him. So when you say that he has a greater tabernacle, ugh, greater than the temple. And now remember, the, the temple at this time is still operational and up. It's not been destroyed. And I don't know, if you look at some of the graphical redeplictions of that temple, it was amazing. That Herod did an amazing job. So the Jew knows what you're talking about when you use that word, tabernacle. And now you're going to say, how is he going to build us and bring us a better tabernacle? Right? I mean, they, they even said that. What are you, what are you talking about? They, they couldn't comprehend. So he's got to also solve this and show that greatness as well. And also in that tabernacle, what was done in order to be with God 
a sacrifice was constantly being made. But he's that sacrifice. So he solves that problem. And that's why you see the dilemma the writer's going to have to negotiate around as he goes through this book. He's got to show that he could actually serve as a priest, bring the tabernacle, and accomplish that whole new union. But it's in the prophets. It's there. They, they just weren't able to see it. And that's what this Hebrew writer's going to do. I remember when I started preaching, Joe and I were studying the book of Hebrews one time, and he called this section in the Hebrews called the lettuce sermons. Have you ever heard that, Gene? It's kind of the lettuce. And because the Hebrew writer goes through here, and on top of all these great things, and, and so what he does is, here's the great thing. And instead of using that word, therefore, which usually links to because of this statement, then pay attention to this. Therefore. In this, what he does is he says, this God is, you know, he'll say, Jesus is greater than the angels. Instead of saying, therefore, he'll say, so let us. Let us, therefore. And so that's what I thought was so neat about that. So I had to bring the lettuce in. <laughs> I had to show that because I, I just kind of remembered that was, okay, just my, I thought it was funny. The let us sermons. So I never forgot that. I actually have a sermon I found. It's lettuce sermon. Um, so it's kind of neat. So what does he do? He'll say, let us, why? Pay more attention. You know, let us make a better effort. Every effort. And then let us move on to maturity. And then let us draw near to God. And not pulling back away from that either. Shrinking back. Let us live by faith. So, that kind of rolls up the big ideas, things that I want us to be able to, as we now move through chapter, chapter 1 and on, to get a good feel for this. And, you know, sometimes I wish I could just get it all into one and you could hold on to what I just said as we go now through this wonderful book and be able to keep that in mind, what I just set up for you. Because that is so wonderful when you can remember these things. So I want you to look for... As we go through, and I hopefully I, I will be bringing it up, the greatness of Christ, and then the admonition of let us. So look for let us as we're going through here. By the way, it's, it's fat-free, so it's okay. I know she just had a lettuce wrap hamburger. Well, it's kind of weird, huh? So let's, let us <laughs> go ahead and read. I want to read the whole chapter because, again, I want to keep that flow together. So starting in... Chapter 1 of Hebrews, starting in verse 1, and I'm reading, out of, I'm reading from the ESV translation. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For which to the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, or again, I will be a father to him. And he shall be a son to me. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Your scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will roll them up like a garment. 
they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, and I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? You know, you want to jump to that angel stuff right away, don't you? I know you, I know you do. I do too, and so we'll get to it. But So what does he do? Let's look at some things real quick, just to kind of look. We saw that flow again, the way he starts out. But you notice when he starts doing this idea of, the you have said, where it's said, or it's said, and again it's said, every one of those, pat, they know it. The Hebrews sit there going, that's right, that's right, that's right. And he quoted it exact, not like I might do and paraphrase. He's doing it exact. So he starts out and says, how did God communicate? And the Jews sit there going, well, through the prophets. That's right in various ways and various times. Not all at once and not all in one way. That is very significant because when we start to look at all the different prophets, we see different things that encounter. And if you, when you go through and study the prophets, you will see certain themes with a message that's, that God is trying to bring to his people. For example, when we look at Hosea, you know, we see the grace of God being expressed in there. When we look at Amos, social justice, and how God was so upset with the social justice. When we take a look at Isaiah, we see the holiness of God being poured out through him at a different time. And then David, we see what? The heart of God. And then in Joel, the judgment of God. But, he says, in these last days, don't expect anybody else. He's not saying that, but that's basically the conclusion. Because now he says, it's all in one place. And this is what we find throughout the New Testament in different places where these men, who were the first uh, disciples and also Christians, they understood that importance because as they grew up, they heard these various times and various messages all their lives. You know, they heard Isaiah quoted, and then they would hear Hosea, then they would hear Joel, they would hear Amos, they would hear all these Habakkuk and stuff, and they would hear all the various times. But now, nope. That's what he's coming to now, is the fact that the greatness of God's Son is because now everything is through Him. He says in this message, He will inherit everything. So everything, when you inherit something, you are the owner. You have the right of everything that's a part of that. So everything that from the prophets to the tabernacle, to ev it's all his. God is giving it to this man, Jesus. Remember that, the man, Jesus. If you're still struggling, oh Hebrew, if you're listening to this, He's getting everything. God is giving him everything there, isn't he? And not only is he giving him everything, but you know what else? He made everything. So he's not a, he's not a prophet. No prophet ever made anything. He didn't create anything. And not only did he create everything, so he's going to inherit everything. He created everything, and he is the one that sustains and keeps things going. Today, we say Mother Nature. And I kind of, I remember one time I had a conversation, somebody said that, I said, you know, well, yeah, boy, Mother Nature hadn't been good to us lately. And this Christian lady said, there's no such thing as Mother Nature. It's God. <laughs> I, I understood what she meant. And I think she's right. You know, there's a part where we need to understand that it's not just randomness that's happening. You know, there's a part. And I see that in the Hebrew writer here in this point, point where he says, he sustains it. If it wasn't for him, maybe comets would be slamming into us and having these life extinction events that they talk about in these apocalyptic movies and such. But everything about him is so amazing. He made the universe. 
So he's made everything. But there's a closer relationship to God the Father. He is the radiance. And and when you look at the word underneath there in the Hebrew as well as in the Greek, it is this type of a radiance, this shining, this just glory about him. And then he steps up and gives a little more description by talking about that he is the image of God. Now, what's the image of God? I mean, has anybody ever seen a picture of God? You know, I mean, so what, is, what are you dealing with when you talk about an image of him? And it is everything about the character. It, that's, that's an image of somebody. When you say John Wayne, what do you think of? An image. You have an image. Now, there's a, there's a physical part to it too, but there's a swagger. There's a certain walk. You know, there's a lot of things that come into it. When I think of certain people and I think of the image of that person, okay, we on earth think of a physical person, but there's a lot to that person that makes that image work. That's the part that he says. So how close is he to God? He's the exact image. He's also got the glory. And so to a Hebrew listening to this, it really has to make them say, wow, if this is true, then I need to really listen. If this guy's going to keep going this direction and really being able to show me this, then man, I am all in. I have to do this because of the greatness of him. So he is the exact character. You talk about you want to see how God gets angry. You want to see how God has mercy. You want to see God's you know, love. Look at Jesus. Look at the way he encountered people. And you will see the character of the Father. God the Father Himself. So He is that exact image all the way around. So, as the writer now continues, then he goes and starts talking about angels. He created everything. He's going to inherit everything. He sustains everything. And now He comes to angels. So what is it with the angels? Why is it important to try to disprove that angels are greater than Him? Well, they had some problems with angels. And it's also kind of interesting because when we, when we just look at the name, it's, it's a messenger. So one of the great, most glorious ways that a message would come second to a prophet was an angel. And it was one of the best things that would happen and looked up to. And so there was angel worship. There was a problem. And we know that Paul in Galatians brings it up and says, tells them, about, you know, either I or an angel. Notice he does it there. That's because they had a problem with it. So now he does bring up the fact of what is the order of things and greatness. And, and basically, they're messengers. That's all. That's what he tries to show there. Now, the angels, and I thought about doing a little study on angels, but we'll save that. But because there's a lot of beautiful things. The more I started trying to prepare and, and kind of squirrel off in the rabbit hole on that, I thought, no, we'll just stick to this and we look at maybe having just a study on angels, maybe a personal study or something else. But we see the action of even like the archangels. When we look at Daniel, it always it just blows my mind when we look at that. The contention between what we see described in Daniel and the evil angels of Persia you know, that they were contending with and all these things going on. You know, they're, they're just kind of supernatural. So you can see even today, people, they're really enamored with the supernatural. It's really easy for people to buy into that supernatural stuff. And what greater than if you're a Jew than angels? When you look at your own history and you read it, you're like, look at these things, these angels. The cherub is an angel. It's one that was assigned that we find playing the role of protecting or being the guard of God's holiness is kind of a way it's also described. We see the seraphim, which is another type of an angel. I know we could draw pictures and go through, and it's kind of strange, but it's just a category of angels as well. And the seraphims we see using more direct, specific kind of like messenger or a messenger. And Satan himself as well was is a fallen angel. So, why is he greater than angels? Well, I already said about the importance of it, but that's what he says. 
problem that they're having, he doesn't really bring it up and say, well, you've got a problem with worshiping these things, but he says, why is he greater? And he says, one, he's got a better name. His name is far greater, and that's what he tries to show them is, there's also a difference between the title son and Aaron boy. And I said that. It's, that's not what he's saying. But if you think about it, it's son, which indicates a personal blood genealogical type of connection, or you're just a Aaron messenger. So that right away starts to go, well, wait a minute, you're right. I mean, if you're a son, you're far greater than any messenger. And also, he brings up and he goes and he shows passages. That's what he was quoting and stuff and bringing the Psalms and such into this and showing how that, no, angels actually worship the Lord. And that's where it gets kind of crazy because when we start going the way he says, let all God's angels worship him, and then it's, it shifts a little bit and it then starts to call, he's quoting Scripture that is pointing out that this Jesus is God. In these, in these passages, he's pointing them to. And so, angels worship him. So that, that gives you an indication. We see the way he uses the idea of wind and this idea of temporariness. They're not as solid. They're, they have a completely different role. Jesus is unchanging. So that's another thing. The other one is, he brings it back to saying, they minister to us. And um, that goes on to, like I said, just a fascinating world when we start to look at that as idea. So the question is, why worship, you know, the worshiper? Why would you worship angels that are worshiping Jesus? Well, don't they're not worthy of worship? In other words, they're just the messengers, and they are actually worshiping who? Jesus, because he's the Christ. And so the application is kind of quit admiring the messengers. It's about the one Christ himself. Isn't that happened today? Isn't there some application in that today? A lot of times people are enamored by preachers or Bible teachers and they start to hold them up and they, they forget that the glory is not to me the messenger, it's to the Father and to the Son. That's where it should go. And so chapters, the verses... Um, we're going to get into 5 and 10 become a little more difficult um, because of this idea of making him a little lower than angels. Um, and so when we look at that, I think that's something that we're going to, we'll get into next week a little more and start to roll into chapter 2, the idea of that. And so that's why I wanted to stop here because I want to spend a little more time on that, on the relationship between him, and that's a good transition to move through this. So I hope, that, I hope you'll enjoy this. Um, if you got questions about the book of Hebrews or something you want me to look at, I, I will work on trying to find an answer to it or a question. Like I said, I can't dive into all of about angels right now, but we will later on. So I hope that if you're with us this evening, whether you're online through YouTube or you're here with us this evening, there's something we can do to help you in your relationship with our Heavenly Father, that you'll take this moment to reflect within yourself and make sure that you are right with God. Because we have no idea how much time we have left. So if you're comfortable and you'd like to, while we're going to sing and you're present in the building, come forward. If you're online and you're ready, you want to know more, drop us a line. Let us know how we can help you. So think about these things while we sing the invitation song.